Welcome everybody to the first video in my series on the science of HLRCC. In order to understand anything about this condition, we first have to understand the anatomy and physiology of what's supposed to normally be happening in a healthy body. And in this case, we have to go back to the biology 101 and see what genes are and what their purpose is and the proteins that they create. And so before we begin that, we have to realize whenever we talk about anything in anatomy and physiology, there's different levels of organization that we can be referenced to. We can either be talking about the whole organism level, our entire body, the systems that make up that body, like the urinary system, digestive system, the organs that make up those systems, like the kidneys, or the tissues that make up those organs. But really what we're going to concentrate a lot on in this series is what's going on at that cellular molecular level, because this is where, when things happen, they influence all the systems above them. And so a lot of times students uh, kind of throw their hands up and kind of give up at this point because it looks so complicated. But I can promise you a lot of it really just has to do with the vocabulary and the kind of technical terminology that they use. The processes and the mechanisms themselves are pretty straightforward once they've been figured out. And so this series, we're going to break these down step by step. And this is going to give you a much better understanding about what's going on in HLRCC. So in order to do that, we have to look at the basics of cell biology. In the humans, our cells are known as what as eukaryotic cells. And this means we contain many little organelles inside of the cell. You can think of these as like little organs and that their job is to form, perform specific functions. And so there's going to be some major organelles that are going to contribute to HLRCC that we really want to kind of focus in on. Particularly today, we're going to look at the nucleus and the ribosome. So if we kind of have a simplified cell right here, here is our cell border or the cell membrane on the outside. And here in blue, we have our nucleus. And what we need to know about the nucleus is this is where we store our DNA. And when we talk about DNA, this is the instructions that uh, teach the cell how to make you. And what we mean by that is there are instructions to create proteins. And proteins basically make up all the machinery of your body. But because this DNA is so important, if we mess up that code or that set of instructions, the cell is going to be clueless on what to do. So when we want to utilize it, what we're going to do is we're going to make a copy of it and then use that copy as that functional unit uh, to translate into protein. And this copy is what's known as RNA. In this case, this is messenger RNA. So this is the usable copy of our genetic code. And once we make that RNA, we're going to send it out into the cytoplasm of the cell where it can be read by ribosomes or what we can think of as the assembly stations. The ribosome's job is to read the code on that mRNA and then assemble together the protein so that we have our final workable product. And so when we look at the basics of DNA, we've all seen pictures of, what, of chromosomes, and this is where we store our DNA. And in this case, when we see our chromosomes in these condensed forms, uh, this is when the cell is about to divide. Normally, our DNA is kind of strewn about in a more uh, workable manner. And what you can see here is the DNA is a double helix, meaning it has two of these thick borders. And in between them is where we have the chemicals that make up the actual code. And those chemicals are what are known as nucleotides. And there's going to be four nucleotides that make up the entire code. And what's nice about these nucleotides is that they always come in the same pairs. And what we mean by that is these C and G, or the cytosine and guanine, they're always paired together. So you can see here in the picture, we have cytosine and guanine connected, cytosine and guanine. And then the other pair is going to be adenine and thymine. And it's always A and T together. It's never going to be T and G or T and C. And if it is, that would be a mistake. And so that's the ingenious thing about DNA is if we know one side of the code, we automatically know what the other side of the structure should be because they complement each other in a one-to-one -one fashion like that. And so when we kind of look at the overall picture, what we have is what's called the central dogma of biology. And that means every cell that we know of goes through this process where we start with the DNA, and then we make our copy through a process called transcription, and then we have our single strand of RNA, and then this RNA is read by those ribosomes, and we translate that code into our actual protein. So it's always going to go in this order. So here now we're going to break down each of these processes. So here's our example of a gene. When we say a gene, this is just a single portion of that long strand of DNA that codes for a specific protein. So this is just a general uh, strand or gene. 
We can pretend this is FH if you want. And you'll notice we have something called a promoter code up here. We have to have something that signals the start of the gene. And so what happens is we have other proteins called like transcription factors, which will be more important later on in this course. And these transcription factors are going to bring uh, another enzyme called RNA polymerase, which is going to signal the start of the uh, copying of this code. And so from here, another enzyme called helicase, we have to unzip the DNA so that we can expose these nucleotides so that we can make copies of them. And so after we unzip the DNA, we're going to have two separate strands. We have our coding strand down here. And what we mean by coding DNA is this string or sequence of nucleotides is the actual code that's used to make the proteins. However, on top, we have the complementary code or the template DNA, and this is what we're going to use to make the mRNA. And what we mean by that is to make mRNA, we're just going to use whatever nucleotide pairs with the one we see on the template. So T, we know to put an A. A, we're going to put a U. So instead of a T here, uh, mRNA uses a U or a uracil. Uh, for our sakes, it's completely functionally the same, doesn't change anything. And so we're just going to go down this template and make an exact copy of our coding DNA. And this is how we put our RNA together. So now that we have our copy or our messenger RNA, how do we read uh, this sequence to make those proteins? What we do is we break up the RNA into chunks of three or triplets called codons. So we have three nucleotides per codon, and each of these codons is going to code for a specific amino acid. So when we say amino acids, uh, there's going to be a group of 20 of them that our body uses, and they can be broken up in different groups. For instance, these three amino acids all share a positive electrical charge at their one tail, or these two will share a negative electrical charge. And these characteristics are going to influence how we kind of configure or put together our final protein product. But when you think of amino acids, you can think of them as the building blocks for proteins, just like how you put Legos together to build a big structure. Same exact thing with uh, amino acids. So here we have our full list of all 20 that we're going to go into, and we can abbreviate them with uh, their first three letters, or we can use a one letter abbreviation. So now let's take a look back at our mRNA, and we have our codons here, and then these are all our amino acids that we're going to put together based on the sequence of these nucleotides. So here we'll have our chart to let us know what they're called. And here then we have our kind of cipher or our um, example of how to break the code. And so we can look, AUG is our first codon. So when we look at what this is going to code for, we have AUG, and this is going to code for the amino acid methanine. And so that means our cell is going to put methanine at the start. And what's special about methanine or this AUG codon is this is our start codon. This is what that play sign there means. Every protein is going to start with this AUG signal. And then we're just going to go down the line from there. So next we have UAC. So if we look at UAC, we're going to go to, see here, this is tyrosine. And we put tyrosine next. Then we have CGA. Now we have arginine. And we're just going to go down the line like this, making a whole chain of amino acids. And you'll notice at the very end here, we have UAG. If we see what UAG codes for, we don't have an amino acid, we just have this black stop sign. And this is the code to the cell to tell them, all right, we're finished. Uh, we've got all the amino acids that we need. So this is called a stop signal. And so now we've completed our putting our protein string together. And this is what's known as a polypeptide chain. Poly meaning many, peptide meaning protein. So now that we see how we kind of put all these amino acids together, how does the cell know which one goes to which? And this is going to be done through another protein called transfer RNA. Here, this transfer RNA carries what's called an anticodon, meaning it carries the complementary uh, nucleotides that match up here. So as this mRNA is going through the ribosome, we have our first codon, CGA. There's going to be a bunch of amino acids floating around with their transfer RNAs, and they'll just randomly kind of try to bump in. And you'll notice this U and C, they don't fit together. This A and G don't fit together. and so this tyrosine, it can't fit there, and so it goes away. But eventually, the right one is going to find the correct matchup. In this case, arginine fits perfectly, and so we've established our first amino acid in the chain. And it's just going to go down the line like that with the help of these transfer RNAs and these anticodons.
And so at the very end, we have these primary structure or just a straight line of these amino acids. But then as those different chemical, uh, as those different electrical signals and properties of the amino acids interact with each other, they're going to start to fold in on each other in like a three dimensional kind of shape. And so the secondary structure, you're going to kind of form this alpha helix and then this folded beta sheet. And the protein is just going to continue going through these changes. It's going to go through what's known as a tertiary truck structure, where now we're completely folding in on each other. And this folding is super important because this is what determines uh, the properties of that protein and making sure that it functions the way it was meant to function. And so now we have our tertiary structure. And this could be enough, but there's even a further part where we can combine multiple tertiary structures together to form kind of a more complex protein. And so we're going to call this a subunit. And in the case of FH, we have four subunits, all of the same uh, tertiary structure. And so what happens, just kind of like transformers get together and build that mega transformer, we're going to combine these four subunits and form that mega protein known as the quaternary structure. Or in this case, it's a homotetramer. Homo meaning it uses the same four subunits. Uh, some proteins can use different subunits that uh, look differently, and that'd be a heterotetramer. But in this case, FH is a homotetramer. And so when we look at the fumarate hydratase protein, uh, a lot of times you'll see them designed in these ribbon-like structures. So this is our tertiary structure with different domains, um, not that important for our sake. And then as we said, these tertiary structures will come together and form this quaternary final product. And if you look closely, you'll see it says an active site right here. And when we talk about proteins, there's going to be a specific area of that protein where its function takes place. In this case, uh, we're going to go over what the FH protein actually does in a couple of videos, but it's going to convert um, fumarate into malate. And this is where that chemical reaction happens. So here then we can see the fumarate hydratase protein in three dimensions. You can see these white little dots all over are representative of all the amino acids that make up this protein. And we can actually look at the NIH website where they have this three-dimensional structure of the protein. So here we have a ribbon structure. You can kind of rotate it around if you like. You can change the style the way it's set up. I think I prefer the schematic. Yeah, so here's the one I like. And there's different ways of customizing it. And you can see if you know where your particular mutation is, uh, you can find it here on this protein. So now that we've seen the protein, we can now look more closely at the FH gene. So when you look up where this FH gene is, it's going to give you uh, a signifier called a 1Q43. So what do these letters and numbers uh, symbolize? The 1 means it's the FH gene is going to be located on chromosome 1. So quick, quick refresher. Uh, all humans are going to have 46 chromosomes, and we're going to get 23 of those from your mom and the other 23 from your dad. So when that sperm and egg comes together, they combine those 23 chromosomes together and you get 46 total. So you'll notice we have two chromosome ones. And so when we kind of look at it now, our chromosomes horizontal fashion, the Q stands for this long arm, this long inferior arm right here. Uh, P is the short arm up top. So it means we're on this long Q arm. And then 43 stands for the band in which we find the gene. So you'll notice the different shades all around here. Right here where that red triangle is, this is band 43. So the FH gene, if we could color it in, would look just like that right there. And so all together, our FH gene is going to be 29,152 nucleotides long. Uh, you'll, sometimes you'll see different totals for this one. Uh, it depends on where they count it uh, before and after. But you get the general idea. And so what's nice is you can actually look up the entire nucleotide sequence of that uh, gene. So again, here we're using the NIH website. This has all the sorts of information for it. But as you scroll down, we now have all 29,152 nucleotides. So you can see all the A, G, T, C, C, C going all the way down. And right here is where it ends, just over 29,100. And so that's a lot of nucleotides, um, and that would make for a lot of amino acids. But the way our body works is we're going to get rid of a lot of those nucleotides. And what we mean by that is we're going to splice up this uh, sequence of our genome 
um, with what we call exons and introns. So all the nucleotides we don't want to use, we call, we're just going to cut them out of the final product. So in this case, those are called introns. And these introns are cut out and removed. And whatever is left, we're going to call exons. And we're going to combine them together. And so at the very end, then, we have 10 exons that make up our final mRNA or the final sequence that's going to code for the actual protein. So all told, that's a total of 1,530 nucleotides. So you can see we got rid of 27,000 that aren't needed for the coding of the protein. And so when you divide 1,530 by 3, that means we have 510 amino acids. And so what you can do, you can look at other databases where we get rid of all the extraneous introns, and now we just have all of the uh, nucleotides and the exons that make up the final mRNA. So here we have our first exon. We can see the different nucleotide codes and the one letter abbreviations of the amino acid uh, that they code for. And so you can see if you know your uh, mutation is at a specific exon, you can find it here on that list. And as you go down, you can see it ends right here at 510 amino acids. And so when we talk about mutations in the next video, um, I'll show you how you can look up your own mutation using these charts uh, that I just showed you. And so really, this is the basics of what's going on when we talk about DNA and creating protein. So next video, we're going to look at mutations and all the different ways if you mix up the sequence of those codes, it can have um, deleterious effects on the final protein product. And that's what's going on with HLRCC. Uh, so thanks for watching.